Guernsey now. It's Corbett Diamond. Shoot up past there, shoot up past the cut ups. TD's going to do a scallop dive. Phil's going in as well to get some scallops. I'll keep the captain happy. Yeah. yeah. Keep the restaurant supplied. Oh yeah, don't do your talk. What do we have, Matt? 29. 29 metres. 49 metres. <laughs> 29. Let's go get some clappers. Phil, 31. 31. Just waiting to see what the tide's doing. There goes the wreck. Go boys. Oh, yeah. well, how long Twin twelve for JP. Yeah. He's going down for a while. Ten minutes hot time. <laughs> yeah. right. Twenty minutes. Twenty minutes. Forty minutes. Forty minutes out of the water. It's actually the same. I got forty. Twenty one ten, and then forty stage gas. Ten minutes back. Ready for it. Just wait for the call.
actually a lobster for tea, you know, if you have to see one there. Okay. Alright? Yeah, you do. Lobsters are on the menu. On the ladder. There's always one messy one, eh, Richard? Yeah, there's always one big splash. So many ships had fallen foul to the treacherous coastline along the Channel Islands, especially in fog. At 6.45 on the 29th of January in 1887, it was a turn for the Brighton to fall foul of our coastline. Having departed from Weymouth at 12.10am under the command of Captain Thomas Painter, thick fog was entered after passing Portland Bill, approaching Guernsey, just after 6.45 an object was spotted on the port bell. The engines were put full astern, but before the vessel could be stopped, she struck a rock, causing her to rebound. The bell section quickly started to fill with water, the order being given to abandon ship. The 20 passengers and 24 crew quickly got away in three lifeboats. Indeed, so speedily was her departure that many of the passengers were not fully dressed or wearing footwear. About 15 minutes after striking the rock, the vessel sunk by the head, her stern rising into the air as she plunged into deep water. After drifting around for a while in the lifeboats, when the fog cleared, the occupants realised they were amongst the Brays, a group of rocks in the Little Russell off Guernsey. The crew then rowed to Bordeaux Harbour where they were landed at 9.30am. At the time, the exact position of the wreck was unknown. Lost was all the passengers' luggage, about 40 tonnes in general cargo, and 12 bags of Royal Mail, and a coffin containing the body of Miss Marcio of Jersey, being returned from the mainland for burial, which was later washed up in Alderney. Our shot has landed approximately just in front of the forward boiler. These are pelting, swimming over the whole wreck. The spider crabs have also made this a temporary home for themselves. This structure is the forward tubular boiler. The final location was only found after Willie Follar lost a small scallop dredge into the wreck. Richard Keane and friends went down to release it and realised it must be the Brighton. We are now starting to swim astern. This is the area where the engine would have been. This shipwreck has been below the waves for 134 years. This is the area the engine is, probably buried in four feet of sand. Here we find the rear tubular boiler with some valves that are still on top.
checking my air, 160 bar left, that's plenty. And here we find a sea cucumber. As we drop into the rear hold below the accommodation, we find it's all silted up with sand. And we also have a red mullet. Inside this crab pot is a lobster, but don't worry, the other end is a hold so he can get in and out as he pleases. We are now into our 11th minute of our 20 minute planned bottom time. You can just see Matt herding the pelting off the side of the wreck. I'm not sure what this was, but it looks like some sort of trolley with a very modern set of tires on, but it's well and truly buried. Have some bollards. Check out the timber decking that's on the rear part of the paddle wheel. It's still in okay condition. Every shipwreck's got an area that everyone wants to look at. The iconic part of the shipwreck. And this is the Brightons. This is the remaining paddle wheel that's left in place. There's only a handful left of paddle steamers in the whole world that can still be dived. with the pelt and the spider crab, a conga has made this her home. This is an old anchor. It might not even be off this ship. Where there's a conga, there's always a lobster.
Now we're starting to swim towards the bow where our shot landed and I'm now inside the forward hold. This hold had a derrick winch and crane to the front of it and this is all that remains. From here onwards towards the bow seems to be completely buried in sand. Seaweed clings to a faint outline of her hull. We have now reached our planned bottom time. Matt just removes the anchor from Anathan Snaggy on the wreck so we can return back up the shot. just about work out the faint outline of the bow area. For me this is the worst part about the tech diving. I have to wait at 6 meters for 18 minutes now before I can get out of the water. Now it's just me and the jellyfish left. made an appearance but later never
of tide on that buff. And this is how Matt's going to go for a dive. Big splash again. I can see black glass. Days. Glad you could come along and hopefully you enjoyed it. I'll catch you on the next tide. We didn't bottom out but we must have been close. Oh, we'd have a tiny boat. <laughs> 